Hello, good evening, and welcome. It's a pleasure to have you with us for this latest edition of National Book Festival Presents. My name is Marie Arana. I'm the Literary Director of the Library of Congress. This series, National Book Festival Presents, is a year-round extension of the very popular book festival of the same name, the National Book Festival, an offering of original, diverse, thought-provoking programs brought to you by the Library of Congress. Our aim in National Book Festival Presents is to bring you the latest books, the most interesting writers, and by virtue of good matchmaking and good conversation, new insight into the world in which we live today, as well as revelations about the past to which we're all connected. Today, we're very proud to present War, Combat, and the American Soldier, a deeply thoughtful and informative exchange about the human impulse to warfare. Our guests are two distinguished historians on the subject, although each has spent careers dedicated to understanding the most consequential wars of the past 250 years, they have never been in conversation with each other before now. One is Margaret McMillan, a former professor at Oxford University, a historian of World War I, and the author of a groundbreaking work on human warfare. It's called War, How Conflict Shaped Us chosen by the New York Times as one of the 10 best books of the year. Margaret is also the author of a number of works of history, among them Paris 1919, The War That Ended Peace, Dangerous Games, Nixon and Mao, and History's People. Joining her is Rick Atkinson, winner of numerous Pulitzer Prizes for his histories of war, as well as for his coverage of contemporary conflicts around the world, for the Washington Post. Rick is best known for his magnificent liberation trilogy on World War II, including An Army at Dawn, The Day of Battle, and The Guns at Last Light. His most recent book is the first volume of a new trilogy, a fresh new estimation of the American Revolutionary War. It's called The British Are Coming. Rick and Margaret will be interviewed by a great friend of the Library of Congress, a tireless advocate for literacy, and a champion of books on history, David Rubenstein. David is, and has been for many years, dedicated to bringing good books to serious readers. We're very fortunate to have him join us for this truly enlightening exchange about war, combat, and the American soldier. Please welcome David Rubenstein. So we're very pleased to have both Margaret and Rick here today. And uh, let me say what we're going to do is have a very uh, informal conversation with them. I'll ask them questions that relate to their expertise and then also some questions that uh, they can answer jointly if they'd like. So let me just start, if I could, with Rick. And Rick, thank you very much again for joining us. Rick, you were a very successful Washington Post um, journalist. You won uh, two Pulitzer Prizes at the Washington Post. Why did you want to give that up for the boring business of writing books, which is fairly solitary? You're sitting there just researching documents, and then you come out every four or five years with a book. Why did you want to do that rather than being a journalist? Yeah, that's a good question. I've asked myself that. Well, I, I spent more than 20 years in newsrooms, and as much as I love the culture of a newsroom, and as much as I believe in the mission of newspapers, uh, I found toward the end of my stint, that uh, the, the voice of the newspaper felt strangled. I had left a couple of times, took leave to go write books. Uh, but when I would go back to the newspaper, the, the strictures, the conventions of newspaper writing weren't the kind of narrative writing that I, I wanted to do full time. So I decided more than 20 years now to take a flyer and, and leave and try and write uh, narrative history full time. Okay, well, it's worked out for you. You've won a Pulitzer Prize as well in, in writing your books. Margaret, let me ask you, you wrote a book recently on war, which I happen to have here, uh, War, How Conflict Shaped Us, which I very much enjoyed reading. And uh, you are a scholar in many different areas, but why did you decide to write a book on war? I think two reasons. Um, first of all, I do the history of the 19th and 20th centuries, and there's an awful lot of war in those histories. And I've always been interested in war as a driver of change in both domestic societies and international relations. And so it's a subject that's interested me for a long time. And then the second reason is I was asked to give some lectures by the British Broadcasting Corporation. They have an annual series of lectures every year called the Reef Lectures. 
and they said I could lecture on whatever I wanted. And I thought, why not war? It's something I'm interested in. It will make me think about it in a more sustained way. And so it was just having the chance to do it. And once I did all the work, I thought I might as well make a book out of it. Okay. Uh, Rick, uh, you have written a trilogy about the World War II, the European theater. And I have the three books here, and I highly recommend them as well. Uh, they won, One of them won a Pulitzer Prize, as I mentioned. Uh, and you've also written, you're now working on a trilogy on the Revolutionary War. The first volume is out now. And you and I have had previous discussions about that. But as you study the Revolutionary War and World War II, do you feel you're seeing the best of humanity, the creativity, the organization, the leadership, or the worst of humanity, the, the killing and the savagery? How do you look at that? Is it the best of, of uh, humanity or the worst of humanity when you look at those kind of wars? Well, I think it's a lot of both. It's uh, humanity intertwined with inhumanity, unspeakable inhumanity. Uh, I, to me, the, the stress of combat is a great revealer of character, and that's why I'm interested in writing about war. Um, it reveals character the way a prism reveals the inner spectrum of a beam of light. It really flays open uh, an individual, and that has always been the most interesting part of writing about war to me. And certainly you see the best and the worst. You see unspeakable atrocities. You see things that you have trouble imagining that human beings are capable of. And yet, on the other hand, you see extraordinary achievement. You see extraordinary unity at times, uh, in the best of times in war. Uh, and to me, it's, it's just a wonderful way, uh, in an awful way, of trying to get your arms around the human condition. Okay. Margaret, uh, for thousands of years, as long as we have recorded history, uh, there have been wars. But we've often said, well, we've been warlike for several thousand years, maybe 10,000 years. But surely the, our predecessors, they were not warlike. They were peaceful food gatherers. They were hunters. They were just minding their own business. They wouldn't do something so terrible as fighting and killing each other. But you point out in your book that that's not quite the case. Uh, what did you reveal in your book about some of the earliest people that we have learned uh, about? Well, as far as we know, and I say this a bit cautiously, because of course, the further back you go, the more difficult it becomes to establish anything. But the rates of, of killing among hunter-gatherer people seem to have been quite high. I mean, we, we've deduced this, or other anthropologists and evolutionary biologists have deduced it by looking at the traumas that ancient skeletons bear, which seem to indicate that they died as a result of, of violence, which indicates something's going on there, but also looking, and this is tricky, but looking at the few remaining hunter-gatherer societies in the world, and there, there were, of course, more in the 19th century, fewer today, where the rates of homicide seem to be quite high. So, you know, we aren't necessarily a peaceful species, and we seem to have inherited a lot through evolution, which, which can make us violent. It doesn't have to, but it can. When you think about it, you mentioned species. When you think about it, uh, if you look at the jungle in Africa, or let's say, or other places where there are wild animals roam around, you usually don't see species killing their own species. Now, obviously, there's some exceptions from time to time, but usually one species is killing another species, one that's thought to be weaker or more vulnerable. Is it fairly uh, unique to have a species like humans killing each other, or is that fairly relatively common, despite what I just uh, asked you about, I either of you? Well, I would say Rick probably knows more about this than I do, but I would just say that our closest cousins in the animal world, the chimpanzees and the bonobos, are very very like the chimpanzees, in fact, do have the capacity. Certainly the chimpanzees show the capacity to organize each other to kill other chimpanzees. And so it may be something that, that occurs in the natural world as well. I, I, I defer to Rick, though, because he's much more of an expert than, than I am. Well, I'm not sure on this subject, but uh, yeah, I, I was in uh, uh, Botswana a couple of years ago, and uh, I was struck by the number of species where the uh, adult male will kill the cubs, for example, uh, lions. And uh, uh, chimpanzees are known for their warlike behavior against one another. It's quite uh, uh, frighteningly human in a certain way. So I'm not sure that uh, we're, we're unique in that regard. Yeah. Okay. Actually, what's interesting about the bonobos is they're actually quite nice to each other. So yeah, right. I think we have both impulses. We have an impulse for altruism and, and an impulse for the suspicion and fear and hostility of those who aren't like us. Well, maybe that's where we got it from. Uh, who knows? So uh, let me ask you a uh, question for both of you. 
Um, people frequently have said, particularly soldiers, I am prepared to die for my country. And that's often thought to be an honorable thing to do, prepared to die for your country. Why is it that nobody says I'm prepared to die for my neighborhood, my youth group, uh, my church, uh, as a general rule, uh, my state? Why is it, a, what is it about a country that young men and young women are saying, I'm willing to go die for that, my country, whereas you don't see people saying, I'm going to go die for my softball team? What is it about a country which is so, uh, able to get people to say they're willing to die for it? Well, you've certainly seen uh, plenty of killing and dying on behalf of religion. There are people who will say, I'm willing to die for my church in a fashion. I mean, my experience, both writing about uh, war historically and uh, as a war correspondent, spending a lot of time with, um, with American troops over the last 40 years, is uh, almost no one says, I'm, I'm here to die for the flag or I'm here to die for the Constitution. They risk their lives and sometimes give their lives, usually for each other. It's that uh, camaraderie, that uh, love that blooms on battlefields in a way that it blooms nowhere else, in my experience. And um, that is the great uh, generator of sacrifice, I think, uh, when it comes down to, to killing in combat. Um, yeah, they salute the flag, and um, there's a certain amount of, of, of platitude utterance, but um, the guy who throws himself on a grenade, the guy who does heroic things, uh, the, and now the woman who does the same, uh, are generally doing it because of the bond, that unbreakable bond that they have developed with their uh, with their mates. And uh, so I think that, that is uh, at the heart of it. Uh, no, I think I think Rick is Rick is right. Um, I think people will die for their comrades, and that's why I think the military puts so much emphasis. I mean, the military spend a lot of time thinking about psychology because they need to, and they put so much emphasis on building group loyalty, um, the regimental loyalty, the loyalty to the unit, whatever it is. But the notion of dying for a country is something that has persuaded people to fight and die. It's very new, though, and very new in terms of human history. And people didn't identify with their countries really much before the late 18th or 19th century. They identified with their ruler, they identified with their church, they identified with their village. But this notion that there's something called the nation, which is bigger than any of us who belong to it, which precedes us and will go on existing after we're dead, is something very recent in human history. But it can be, I think, in its own way, a motivating force like a religion. Um, so that how soldiers behave on the battlefield may be very much to protect their comrades. But the notion that they will go out and be prepared to die for this abstract thing, whether it's religion or whether it's a, a nation, is something I think that also motivates them. Now, historically, for both of you, uh, when we talk about people fighting in wars, we generally think of men who are young men fighting in wars. Um, is it the case that it's always been young men up until most recently who've been in the military? Uh, Margaret, did you not... Uh, write about some women that have been, uh, were in warrior kind of uh, situations many, many decades, or not decades, but centuries ago, not millennia. Yeah. Well, the whole question of gender and war, I think, is a very interesting one. I can understand why the young are taken to fight, because they've got the energy, and they, they also tend, I think, more than those of us who are older to think that they will live forever, and so they're prepared to take risks in ways that, that we aren't. But I think there's a great debate about this, whether men are in some sense biologically programmed by evolution to want to fight and women aren't. I tend to think myself it's more cultural, that in most cultures down through history, men have been expected to fight and women have been expected to stay and tend the, the home fires. But we do have examples in the past of women fighting. Um, it used to be thought that the Amazons were something the Greeks invented to terrify themselves, the idea of these monstrous beings, women fighting. But in fact, the archaeologists have found graves around the, the Black Sea, for example, which the skeletons, they can now identify using ancient DNA. The skeletons are those of women, and there are remnants of armor around them, and there are signs that these women died in battle. And certainly today, um, and in the Second World War, women have shown that they can fill combat roles. In, in, the, in, the, in the war on the Eastern Front, for example, in the Second World War, Russian women manned artillery batteries, they flew fighter planes, they were snipers, they were guerrillas. And so I think the reason that women haven't fought 
over the great swath of history in the past has tended to be much more cultural than anything to do with the differences between the genders. Okay. Uh, Rick, let me ask you a question relating to the difference between women and men and relating to war. So in World War II, the leaders who were the, the country leaders, the military leaders generally were all men. Um, is it your view that if women had held those positions, if if a female prime minister had been the prime minister of England, or if a female had been the chancellor at the, in Germany, or if a female had been the president of the United States, would anything have really been different in your view? Would women have been more able to find a way to, to avoid war, or that's just a myth that some people would like to talk about? Well, men have mucked it up so thoroughly, I'd certainly be willing to give it a try. I, you know, if you look at the um, exclusive of World War II, if you look at Golda Meir or Margaret Thatcher, those are those are women who are quite truculent as national leaders and quite capable of, of waging war as national leaders. In World War II, had Roosevelt or Hitler or Churchill been supplanted by a woman, I'm not sure it would have changed history because you presume that Hitler aside, Hitler is sui generis, but you assume that the pressures and the impulses that have taken the country toward war are going to uh, show that there will be a, a, a female who's willing to take it all the way. Um, you know, counterfactuals are fun because you can never be wrong. Mm -hmm. uh, my feeling is that, um, the, you know, I see women in the American military now, virtually every MOS, military occupational specialty, is now open to women, fighter pilots, infantry, uh, soldiers, and so on. And uh, having watched them now for a while, I know that they're entirely capable of doing anything a man can do, and they're capable of doing a number of things better than men can do. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I think as national leaders, uh, I would think no, expect no less of them. Okay. Yeah, so, uh, I, uh, Margaret, let me ask you this. Uh, when we go to war, when people go to war, uh, more or less they're trying to win, and very often that means killing other people. Um, enormous amounts of other people. Why is it that it's okay to kill other people in a war, but there's certain things that are called war crimes? Why are certain things crimes, but other things are okay? It's okay to kill people sometimes, but if you do it in a certain way, it's a crime. When did that concept arise? I think it's been there perhaps as long as we've had organized war. Um, you know, it's, it sounds ridiculous that we're trying to control something which is about violence, but we are. And we always have done. Um, you know, the G Greeks in the classical age had rules about when they would fight and when they wouldn't fight. And they wouldn't fight during the Olympics, for example. They wouldn't fight on holy days. In the Middle Ages, the church in Europe tried to impose a rule that you didn't fight on the sacred holidays like Easter and, and Christmas. And most cultures have that. They've had rules and they've had weapons which they've regarded as illegitimate, weapons they've regarded as legitimate. I mean, it's curious, but we seem to be as good at trying to control war, not perhaps quite as good, but we try and control war as we continue to fight it. And it's sometimes I think it's it's just fashion. Um, you know, we regard poison gas with absolute horror. And I think that's very much a result of what happened in the First World War when both sides developed various forms of poison gas and used it. But we don't regard flamethrowers in the same way. We don't regard incendiary bombs in the same way. We, there are all sorts of weapons which we you know, sometimes a fashion is the wrong word, but sometimes we conceive a particular horror for something and something equally horrible. Uh, we just don't focus on in the same way. But we're always trying and we continue to try to control war. And, and we've continued to try and control the sorts of targets that are legitimate. You know, we've tried throughout history to try and protect civilians, not always very well, but it's something we keep trying to do. Well, uh, Rick, after World War II, there were the Nuremberg trials. For there were war crime trials, and many people were uh, sentenced to death who were in those trials. What was it that the Nazis did that was war crimes that would that some people would say, or they would have said, "Well, look, I was just fighting for my country. I was just fighting a war. I didn't do anything that was criminal." Well, and there were a whole series of uh, of trials, uh, not just uh, the, the big shots at Nuremberg. I mean, in general, the thing that I think propelled the uh, the victors to take victors justice was the um, horrific scale of the Holocaust. Um, I think that once the Holocaust was fully revealed, beginning in the spring of, of 1945, 
um, there was a feeling that uh, somebody needed to pay for this and that the wheels of justice needed to throw up um, the culprits and the culprits needed to be punished accordingly. Um, I mean, if you look at uh, Goering or Himmler or Hess or uh, Hitler himself, some of whom survived the war, um, it's hard to make an argument, although their uh, defense counsel did, that they were simply either following orders or were simply uh, following the conventions of, of, uh, of an international war. You know, the extent uh, and depravity of the killing uh, that the Third Reich and its, uh, its fellow travelers did um, really went beyond anything that uh, I think anyone could imagine. All right. Well, let me, let me ask both of you this. Uh, in war crimes, uh, I understand what you're talking about. There are certain things that are beyond the pale, but why is it considered uh, okay to um, carpet bomb lots of people, use Agent Orange, that neither of those things are considered to be war crimes, but it's considered, it's considered offensive if you try to kill the leader of the other country. In other words, why did the United States not specifically target Hitler, for example, or specifically target Hirohito? Um, wh why not just go after the, the head person and maybe that would end the war quicker and save lives? Why is it that that's considered a terrible thing to do? I'm not sure it is considered so terrible. I mean, I think logistically it's just, it's very difficult to do. Um, Hitler was always very well protected. He, he was spent most of the war in a bunker in, in, in what had been East, you know, the eastern part of, of Germany. Um, and to actually find out where he was and, and try and kill him, I think would have been very difficult indeed. And I'm not sure that the Allies would have shrunk from trying to kill him if they possibly could. Um, and possibly the same thing with the Emperor. I don't know that it was ever discussed. Um, certainly Tokyo itself was very heavily bombed and I'm, I'm not sure that the, any attempt was made to spare the, the, the Imperial Palace in the, in the heart of Tokyo. Um, if you can manage to kill the person who is directing the war effort on the other side, I think that person is a legitimate target. But I think logistically, it was just very difficult to do. It's easier now in a way. Okay, yeah, we, we, uh, we did try to kill Hitler. We dropped tens of thousands of tons of bombs on Berlin. Uh, and there was no effort not to kill him, and there was discussion in the targeting about uh, hitting the Reich Chancellor and, and other targets where he possibly could be. Margaret's right. He was usually 30 feet underground, well protected. Uh, uh, when uh, the July 20th, 1944 plot unfolded and the Germans tried to do it, Count Stauffenberg tried to blow him up, um, we cheered. Uh, we cheered quite overtly when we found out about it. So, um, I don't think uh, there are rules today. There is a, there's a presidential directive uh, against assassination. Uh, but uh, in all out war, I don't think we've shied away from uh, trying to kill leaders. In some cases, we have killed. Leaders. OK, so uh, let me ask you this. Um, uh, presumably, people that start wars think they're going to win them. Nobody, I assume, starts a war thinking I'm going to lose, but I, I'm happy to lose. Maybe occasionally there's somebody like that. But generally, you, you probably start a war thinking you're going to win or get some benefit from it. Does history show that those people that start wars actually wind up winning the wars? Or does it show that those people that start the wars wind up losing the wars? Uh, Margaret? Well, as, as, a, as a German chancellor once said, Starting a war is like rolling the iron dice, and you don't know whether got, you know whether you'll get heads or tails. And wars are uncontrollable. Um, you know, generals may think that they have, and that their political masters may think that they have very neat plans, and they will fight a war, and then they'll stop it at a certain point. But the very nature of war, I think, is it has the potential always to run out of control. Um, in the 18th century, in Europe, they were able to fight fairly limited wars because both sides agreed on on sort of the rules, and both sides were prepared to stop before they completely annihilated the enemy. In fact, it was not something they wanted to do. But in modern war, I think we, we face a real problem of knowing how to end it. And I think often nations will get into a war without any real clear plan as how they're going to get out of it. You know, the German high command went to war in 1914 without any very clear plan of what would happen if they actually managed to defeat France and, and where the war would go from then. What if they didn't manage to defeat France? What if they managed to defeat Russia? They hadn't really thought it through. The other danger with wars, of course, I think is once you start them and the costs begin to mount, and it depends on the war, but the costs are usually more than you want to pay and they, they tend to mount very quickly. 
you then find that your war aims expand. It becomes more and more difficult to stop when you have already lost a lot of lives. You've already um, expended a lot of your, your national wealth. And we, we saw this in, in certainly the first, the first World War, where it became more and more difficult to stop the war because it had cost so much. And I think the Americans experienced something the same in, in Vietnam. I mean, one of the arguments made for not ending the war in Vietnam was we have to, you know, we cannot pull out now because of all those American lives that have already been lost. We have to make it worthwhile. And so I think people often don't go into wars, those guiding wars. They go into a war thinking we'll win a victory, but they don't often, or, or quite often, they don't think beyond that. Uh, what happens once we win the victory? And that's that's often when the problems start because they haven't thought it through. Rick, let me ask you this. As technology has advanced, uh, the president of the United States, for example, can sit in the Oval Office and call the Secretary of Defense and say, why don't you launch some cruise missiles? And there's no real risk of the United States losing uh, men typically on a cruise missile from, a, let's say, a submarine or, or other kind of uh, a ship. Is the technology now so uh, advanced that it makes it easier to feel you can launch a war without having any adverse repercussions, at least in terms of losing men? And is that a, a negative because it makes people feel, well, the cost of, uh, of starting a war or trying to kill some people isn't as great as it used to be? Well, first of all, there's always been a, uh, an effort to get standoff, to be as far away from uh, the enemy as you can be, whether you go back to the longbow. Uh, or you're talking about cruise missiles. You're trying to get as far away as you can in order to minimize the opportunity for an immediate counterstrike. I mean, the problem with the, the scenario that you're talking about, David, is, and we've seen it recently, the United States used smart uh, precision munitions to kill a, an Iranian general, maybe their most charismatic general, Soleimani, uh, uh, he was dispatched neatly with uh, no collateral damage that we know of, other than people he was traveling with who were also considered bad people. And the Iranians subsequently retaliated with a barrage of rockets on a base in Iraq. Uh, they were quite accurate. Uh, uh, and the, although there were no Americans killed in that retaliatory attack, there were a number who were injured, and there's a serious problem with traumatic brain injury to those who suffered through this protracted attack. So yeah, you can say if you're the president of the United States, I will press a button and presto, I don't put our forces in harm's way right now, but there's always the risk of retaliation and the same thing that Margaret was talking about a moment ago, spiraling out of control. If there's one rule that I think applies to war generally, at least my study of it, it never goes how you think it's going to go. Never. It always goes in a different direction than you have posited. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's true whether you're uh, launching the kind of attack that the Japanese did at Pearl Harbor in December 1941, or you're trying to be precise and use pinpoint attacks uh, with the contemporary weapons. By the way, Rick, when, when you were at the Washington Post, sometimes I think you were embedded uh, with uh, combatants. Is that right? Yes. So when you're embedded with combatants and, um, you know, you hear somebody saying something, you ever say, well, that's wrong. I'm a journalist here, but you're going to make a mistake here. I know this is this not right, what you're saying, or you can't do that? <laughs> I should have thought of that. Yes, I was with Petraeus in, uh, in the 101st Airborne in, in Iraq. I've, I've been with the various commanders in various scenarios. I, I have never spoken up and offered military advice. It would not be appropriate for me as a journalist. Um, I've been in circumstances. One of the things that I've also learned is that uh, the loneliness of command leads commanders to need somebody to confide in. And often that is somebody out of the chain of command. And so frequently that would be me. Uh, so, but I would never offer advice. Uh, I okay. never can guess. But what would a journalist do if, you, you let's suppose you know there's a whole bunch of IEDs that are likely to be exploded if somebody walks on them and you see some soldiers that you've been in, embedded with and you see they're walking where you just happen to know because you were there the two days before that there's a lot of IEDs there. Are you not supposed to say, don't walk there? Or are you just basically say, look, I just can't say anything? Oh, well, that's quite different. Of course. I mean, you, you can't allow, for one thing, you become uh, inevitably uh, emotionally attached to the people around you, uh, particularly some uh, poor uh, GI who's walking into a minefield. If I knew it was a minefield, I would have a moral obligation to say so. Okay. 
Uh, right. uh, that's that's quite different. Okay, uh, Margaret, let me ask you about uh, the most complicated war in many ways is nuclear war because nuclear war is you know is war that you know lots of people are going to die. Now, the only time a nuclear bomb has ever been dropped twice on uh, uh, Hiroshima and Nagasaki was when only one country had nuclear bombs. Now that other countries have them, they're so-called mutual assur assured destruction. If you uh, put a nuclear bomb on me, I'm going to put one on you. And as a result, there have been no nuclear bombs dropped since 1945. Why is it so bad to let other countries, let everybody have a nuclear weapon, therefore nobody will ever use them? Why is that considered to be a terrible idea? Well, I think we should look at what happened during the Cold War when we came very close, both sides came very close to using them. You know, we, we escape really, I think, often by the skin of our teeth from a nuclear war. I mean, the Cuban Missile Crisis was, was a tense moment. Um, the aftermath of the shooting down of the Korean airliner in 1983 was a time when, when I think nuclear war came much closer than we knew at the time. And then there were just the accidents. Um, you know, there were the misread signals. There were the um, technicians or the people who thought that an attack was coming in when it wasn't. And so, you know, the, these, are, these are terrifying weapons. I mean, there are other terrifying weapons in this world, as we know, but nuclear weapons, I think, we regard with a particular horror. The other thing I think that's worrying is the more people have nuclear weapons, sooner or later, someone's going to think they can use it. You know, the nuclear weapon is a very odd one. It's, it's the one that has been built not to be used in a way. But there's a whole range of nuclear weapons. I mean, there are, there are small nuclear weapons, smaller smaller warheads, bigger warheads. Sooner or later, the more proliferation, someone is going to say, well, I can just use a little one or I can use it. And, you know, if you get someone like Hitler who is prepared to destroy his whole country rather than, than suffer defeat, bring the whole, you know, that terrifies me, quite frankly. Right. Um, on nuclear weapons, the United States has a system that supposedly works where the president of the United States has a little code and he calls the code into the next, the person in the chain of command and then they send it to somebody in some, some base that, and these two guys go and they have to simultaneously do turn a key or whatever they do. Are you convinced from your knowledge, I, I realize you're not the expert on nuclear weaponry, but are you convinced that uh, it's impossible for, let's say, the United States to have rogue soldiers launch a nuclear weapon? Is that impossible to do, you think? Um, I would never say anything is impossible related to war. And I think that the fail-safe systems that have been established over the decades are pretty good. Uh, they've worked so far. That doesn't mean they'll work tomorrow. And, um, uh, you know, I think that the, the efforts to upgrade that fail-safe system here and to support those, including the Russians and the Chinese, uh, in upgrading their systems to make sure that there is no rogue launch, that there's no accidental launch, uh, is very, very important. I, I mean, the, the doctrine of MAD, mutually assured destruction, is actually uh, predicated on a, a level of sanity among those who have uh, nuclear weapons. And, uh, you know, Margaret's quite right. I think that the greater the proliferation, the greater the number of, of, of actors who have nuclear weapons, uh, the greater the odds that somebody's going to use one under some circumstance. Um, also, the danger that uh, some will get loose and that uh, the original owner will not know where it is. And um, we know the horrors that that could involve. So, um, you know, I think that the, the persistent effort to reduce nuclear stockpiles, the persistent effort to um, engage other nuclear powers in uh, having uh, not only fail-safe arrangements and agreements, but... Uh, um, uh, a sense that they know what they're doing and a collective sense of trying to prevent Iran and others from getting them too late for North Korea. Uh, and that's very worrisome. Uh, but I think that that, you know, there's nothing that worries me more, including climate change. Okay. Um, Rick, let me ask you, uh, about on World War II, had the D-Day invasion failed, would the Allies have ever been able to regroup and win that war? Uh, yes, by June 1944, uh, the Axis powers were on their heels. Um, had the invasion failed, um, they would have gone back to the drawing board. Eisenhower probably would have been relieved as the supreme commander. Um, but it would have protracted the war, certainly for another year, maybe two years. It uh, would have made it all the more difficult for the Soviets on the Eastern Front. Um, it would have provided 
some relief to uh, to the Japanese because we would not be able to begin shifting forces uh, to the Pacific as we did uh, in the winter of 44, 45. Um, but uh, I think the handwriting was on the wall and even had the invasion trail. All right. who, Rick, who was the greatest general that you have studied in World War II? If there was one general that you could pick to lead a military uh, effort, who would it have been? Who would you Lucian, think was the best? Lucian K. Truscott, Jr., somebody most people have never heard of. Hmm. Lucian K. Truscott, Jr. was from uh, Oklahoma, grew up in Texas, taught school in one-room schoolhouses for six years. Uh, we see him first in World War II on the beaches of Morocco in 1942 as a one-star he is, in my mind, and he ends up the war as a four-star. He's going to be the American uh, commander in uh, in Italy at the end of the war. He is, in my mind, the single greatest combat leader that the American army produced during hey. the war. Hey, Margaret, I'm sorry. Margaret, um, you are not an American, so you have some different perspective on what happened on our, in our capital on January the 6th. Uh, I'm just curious, what is your observation of of what happened, that kind of, not quite a war, but if you could call it an insurrection. Were you surprised that that happened? I was at the time. Um, I was shocked. I mean, I'm a Canadian, and we see the United States as cousins, family. Um, we don't always agree with you. Um, like all families, we have our differences, but we see you as being very much part of the same family. And I was stunned to see it, quite frankly. And then, of course, when I began to think on it, and as the comments came, I thought, this is something that has actually been brewing for some time, that this wasn't a one-off event, that a lot of these people had been come convinced through um, the media they followed that, that the, le the election had been stolen. And I think they'd been convinced even earlier on that many of the institutions of the United States, its legal system, its political system were illegitimate or corrupt. And it did shock me deeply, um, you know, because we've tended, all of us who live outside the United States, even though we can be, as you know, critical, we've tended to look to you and admire you. And we also see you. I mean, the old the old expression was leader of the free world, and that may be outdated now. But, um, you know, I think for Canadians, we'd rather live in a world with the United States as the hegemon um, than China is. And so, yes, it was deeply shocking. Okay. Now, on your book, uh, which the New York Times has said was one of the best books of the year, 10 best books of the year, which I highly agree with. It's a terrific book. If somebody says, I really don't know if I want to read this book, can you summarize it for me in one paragraph about why I should read this book and what I'm going to learn? What would you say is the essence of what the message is in your book? I think I'd say if you want to understand what it is to be human, and if you want to understand how our world has come to be the way it is, and if you want to understand something about how our institutions and values as societies have evolved, then you need to understand about war. It's a fundamental part of what has helped to make us what we are. We don't have to like it. I didn't write it because I like war, but I think without understanding war, without confronting it, we don't understand ourselves and we don't have a hope of preventing it in future. Okay, Rick, um, General George Washington was, I think, 43 when he became the uh, Revolutionary War General. Um, he had lost more battles before than he had won, and he lost more battles in in World War in the Revolutionary War than he won. Uh, how did he win the war when he was losing a lot of battles? And was he really that good a general, or he just happened to look good in a military outfit? <laughs> and he did look good in a uniform. Uh, you know the trait that Napoleon most cherished in his generals: luck. And Washington has a lot of luck. That's not to be undervalued or sneered at in war. Um, he is not a. Um, he, he does not see a battlefield spatially and temporally the way great captains like Napoleon do. He's not a natural field marshal. Eisenhower is the same way. They don't. They miss things, and uh, we see Washington performing badly as a battlefield commander at Long Island, at Fort Washington, uh, Brandywine. He has his moments for sure. At Trenton, he does pretty well. At uh, Monmouth, but um, his skill, uh, first of all, is he's going to be there for eight years. He's got a durability and robust constitution that's extraordinarily important. Mm -hmm. um, he's also got the ability to uh, rally the country and his army around him. He is proverbially the indispensable man. He's commanding the indispensable institution for this nation republic, um, and that is the American army. 
So he's got a skill set um, that includes he's got a, a, a brain organized for executive uh, action. He's extraordinarily capable in uh, identifying subordinate talents so that he sees that an overweight 25-year-old Boston bookseller named Henry Knox is going to be the father of American artillery. Uh, so he's got a skill set that uh, is right for the role, even as he has failings as a battlefield command. Okay. So we're just about out of time. I have time for one question each for each of you. So Margaret, if, if uh, some student uh, walks into you, your office in Oxford and says, I'm thinking of being a war correspondent, do you think I'll have a lot to do over the next 10 or 20 years? Would you tell him or her that maybe they should go into something more important like private equity? Or you tell them there would be a lot of things that they could cover in, uh, in the war world over the next 10 or 20 years? I'd say, unfortunately, there will be a lot of activity for them. Um, I don't think war is going to disappear anytime soon. I mean, there are wars in the world at the moment, which are many of which show no signs of ending. And I think we will continue to have wars in the future. I'm not sure I'd recommend, but Rick's been a war correspondent. I haven't been. I'm not sure I'd recommend anyone to become a war correspondent. It's, it's a dangerous business and can, I think, take a tremendous psychological and, and often physical toll. But if a student wants to be a war correspondent and seems to know what, what that student, he or she is doing, then yes, I think they will have enough to do in the next few years. Okay. A final question, Rick. Um, you haven't finished your two final volumes of your trilogy on the Revolutionary War, but can you give us a little hint? If we had lost the Revolutionary War in the United States, what would really have happened? Because wouldn't we have figured out how to break away some way like Canada eventually did? Or would it really made that make much a difference if we had lost that war? Well, no one, no one had the wit in the 1770s to come up with the idea of a commonwealth. And it's quite possible that had the British succeeded in uh, suppressing the insurgency, uh, that the, you know, the idea of a commonwealth would have emerged sooner than it actually did. And perhaps we'd uh, be brothers and sisters with Canada in a, in a different way than we are now. My feeling is, Margaret made this point earlier, and it's quite true, when wars begin, uh, and when George III decides that he's going to go to the mat, um, often those who are waging that war have no idea where they're going next. And I think that's true with the British. Had the British succeeded, for example, in killing Washington, destroying the American army, and suppressing the insurrection, uh, it's not uh, evident to me at all that they would have then been able to suppress the impulse toward independence that you found in the 13 states at that time. That uh, there would have that the, the army of occupation that would have been required uh, would have been very very expensive, even, even uh, as expensive as okay. the war itself was. So um, my feeling is that um, you know we were not going to. Uh, join the British Empire, regardless of what happens on the battlefield. Okay. For either of you, if the United States had succeeded in its several efforts to conquer Canada, would the world be better off if Canada was part of the United States, or we're we better off just having a separate country? <laughs> the answer? Well, well I, have a, I have a Canadian son-in-law, and I cannot begin to uh, suggest okay. a good idea. Yeah, okay. you'd, well, you'd probably have a permanent democratic majority because whenever Canadians are asked how they'd vote, uh, about 70% of us would vote Democrat. So. Okay, well, um, thank you both for a very interesting conversation on a very serious subject, uh, war. And uh, I highly recommend the books that you have uh, written about these subjects. And thank you very much for participating in this Madison Council event. Thank, thank you. you, David. Thank you, Margaret. Thank you. Pleasure. It was a pleasure to talk to you both. Thanks. Thank you, David, and thank you, Margaret and Rick, for that very informative conversation on the rules of war and what it takes to make a good soldier. Please join us again for our next interview on National Book Festival Presents. Until then, you can find other conversations like this one at the link you see on your screen below. Thank you for joining us.